It's really my honor and pleasure to be here attending WEI's event in my home country. And I also want to, uh, I want to send my special thanks to my former major professor, Myron Cohen. Yes. And I also want to thank um, WEI. When I was a graduate student at Columbia University, WEI was very generous in sponsoring my summer field work in China and also my dissertation writer. And recently, he also accepts my book manuscript to become part of his publication series. So I'm very grateful of it. And I'm very, also very glad to participate in this discussion concerning Taiwan. As an anthropologist, I hope to call your attention to one of the aspects of Taiwanese society which has often been overlooked when we discuss about Taiwan's future, either political or economic. So I will give a brief presentation about Taiwan, Taiwanese indigenous people. I consider them to be standing at a crossroad because their situation in Taiwan has gone through quite dramatic changes over the three decades since the 1980s. This, pa this past April, a group of Taiwanese indigenous people who were denied by the government with the indigenous status made a formal appeal to the UN Special Repertoire against the Taiwanese government's decision. It's not the first time that Taiwanese indigenous people bypassed Taiwanese government to appeal their rights to the international community and received support. Such actions simultaneously humiliate Taiwan's politicians and encourage some because, as some say, UN recognized Taiwan as a country in accepting this sort of case. Whether such a reaction is optimistic or naive, we may conclude that Taiwanese indigenous people have a special, have a special standing. When we look at Taiwan's social science research, scholars usually bypass indigenous people, and by and large, it's anthropologists who have long been concerned with their culture and society. Even research about marginal people pays more attention to foreign guest workers or immigrant brides than to Taiwanese indigenous people. In general, Taiwanese indigenous people as a whole are often invisible to the mainstream society. But on the other hand, uh, when Taiwan wants to broadcast its image to the world, indigenous people will definitely play a role in such a presentation. For example, even Taiwan's largest computer producer, Acer, uses Taiwanese indigenous people to show its authenticity and attraction. Let me take a look at this. It doesn't show up.
this is why Kotoan is indigenous people and invisible and impressive population. There have been various ethnic groups among Taiwanese indigenous people. At different time periods and under different political agendas, they are named differently and divided into different numbers of groups. Now their official group name is Indigenous Peoples, which was endorsed by the government in 1994 after so many years of indigenous elites fighting for it. And by 2008, there are 14 ethnic groups recognized by the government, and the long list of appeals to gain independent group status is still there. In tandem with group identification has been the ethnic identity as opposed to Han people. Before the 1980s, following the mainstream discourse, they often called themselves as mountain peoples, Shanbao, and many of them identify themselves as Chinese. Beginning in the early 1990s, indigenous elites struggled to rename themselves as indigenous peoples, Yuan Zhuming, and saw them as genuine native Taiwanese. From the mid-1990s, when the cross-strait relationship between Taiwan and China became tense, some indigenous elites began to shift away from the Han conceptual framework and relate themselves with a broader regional connection called Austronesia, Nandao Mingzu. Anthropologically and linguistically, they are right. This picture shows you the region of pan Australasia. Taiwan is at its northernmost. One school of thought proposed by archaeologist Peter Bellwood suggested that Taiwan is the origin of all Austronesian peoples based on its linguistic complexity. Ever since then, indigenous elites have had more strategies to deploy between Taiwan and China, as well as between Taiwan and the wider international community because of their indigenous status. Through the indigenization movement, plus Taiwan's democratization and efforts to gain legitimacy that jointly distinguish Taiwan from China, Taiwanese indigenous people began to gain increasing political resources, such as political seats at the legislative yuan and preferential treatment in various aspects of government and social arenas. On the other side, China is also taking Taiwanese indigenous people as a political token. One thing in China's ethnic identification is often overlooked by both foreign and Taiwanese scholars, that is, mountain peoples is counted as one of China's 55 ethnic minority group. So we may often see Taiwanese indigenous politicians walk a fine line between the cross strait. For many reasons, Taiwanese government has gradually endowed many indigenous rights since 1994, such as establishing a ministry-level council of indigenous peoples under the executive yuan in 1996 to deal with the national budget earmarked for indigenous affairs. In 2002, the council claimed some land rights using GIS and collective memories to define the traditional te tribal territories. In 2004, a public indigenous television station was established. In 2007, the council passed the system that provides indigenous language certificates for teaching and education. There are also some other affirmative actions, such as preferential treatment in education and employment. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, over the years, the indigenous people have experienced a dramatic move from rural to urban areas. In total, between 1983 and 2008, their total population increased by 2.3 percent per year, much higher than the Han people. This has been due to both natural growth and the loosened policy in recognizing indigenous status. In, 2000, uh, in 1983, only six of indigenous people lived in urban areas. These color areas are their traditional territories along the central mountain range and by the Pacific Ocean. But 
by 2008, about 40 of them have mainly resided in the three urban centers in the West. There seem to have many positive changes concerning indigenous peoples and their life. However, something else remains unchanged or, became, or becomes even worse. For example, the indigenous policies continue to be protection-oriented instead of sustainable development. And the calls for cultural preservation has hampered their participation in the mainstream and globalizing trends. And worse yet, some inequalities between grassroots level indigenous society and the mainstream society remain obvious and sometimes even more glaring than before. The average income gap is an example. In recent years, the average income of indigenous people compared with that of the national level has declined. Health disparity is another problem. On average, Indigenous people's life expectancy is 7 to 11 years lower than the national level over the years. Among the three major killers, cancers, accidents, and liver diseases are considered often related to alcoholic drinking. In contrast to the three major killers of non-Indigenous people, such as cancers, heart diseases, and cerebrovascular diseases. They are generally related to an urban lifestyle. Moreover, psychological trauma and other health risks related to natural disasters, such as typhoon and mudslides, have also contributed to the general health disparity between indigenous and non-indigenous people. In short, the point I have tried to emphasize is, although indigenous people as a whole have gained increasing political and financial resources from the government, yet in everyday life and at the grassroots level, their well-being has declined. This uneven development is part and parcel of the elite politics at play. So how to change such a problematic development is at the hands of indigenous elites who constitute part of the government. The ruler is no longer the Han alone. Some challenges facing indigenous elites are internal stratification between elites and ordinary people and internal conflicts among indigenous groups. Sometimes the division between indigenous groups are even bigger than the indigenous versus non-indigenous division in fighting for political power, resources, and indigenous rights. Indigenous elites also need to ponder whether they should pursue autonomy with uncertain futures or embrace participatory development under the current status quo or they should, or whether they should maintain their native languages through incentive, educational incentives with additional investment of time and energy, or they should embrace or market oriented languages at the risk of losing their native languages. These are all common dilemmas facing the marginalized people in a, in a neoliberal and globalizing world. According to recent research, the gap between indigenous elites and ordinary people in thinking of these issues is huge. It's not a surprise. Elites may be thinking of group survival while ordinary people are struggling for daily life. Yet elites can no longer position their fight through ideological approach in opposition to the Han as they did in the 20th century. In the 21st century, they are facing more challenges emanating not just from the mainstream society, but also from their fellow people at the grassroots level. I end my brief present presentation of Taiwanese indigenous people here. Thank you for your attention.